to Shaquana. I know it's been a long journey. At first, you had some hesitation about doing it, but I told you before, I got your back, and I'm always going to have your back. So, book two, three, and four, let's go, let's do it. This is the, only the beginning of future books and future endeavors. Um, God is going to bless your ministry because this is a ministry. You telling your story is going to help someone else. So please don't be afraid to dig deep into whatever you're going through right now, your, your personal uh, trauma that you experience even, even right now because sometimes we still experience trauma and we're overcoming those things. So overcome your testimony and tell your testimony and let's get this money, let's get these books done. To my niece, Shaquana, I am amazed, I am blown away, but I am not surprised. You are doing exactly what you were purposed to do, what you were called to do, what we did what you could do all along. I'm super excited to read the book. I'm so glad to be a part of your journey and so thankful to God that you have made it this far. The sky is not the limit. You're going way far beyond people never thought of you. You spoke it out of your own mouth and we can't wait to see it. I love you so much. God bless you. We're going to celebrate the next and then the next and then the next. I love you. Congratulations. Congrats. I can't wait to read the book. Yes, I'm me so too. Proud of you. you inspire all. Continue doing what you're doing. Yes. I'm so proud of you. Huge shout out to my favorite girl. I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited to look see what God is doing in your life. It's only elevation from here. There's no limit to what you can do. And you are a dynamic woman who is going to the next level. I read your book, loved it. I couldn't put it down. Had to keep reading it. Um, just want to say you're very courageous, all that you've been through. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're very courageous yeah. in your journey. We can't wait for part two. Okay, I just want to say I love you so much, sis. Um, I'm so thankful for you, and um, it's amazing how you came uh, forward on your journey and looking forward to great things to come. Congrats, Sissy. I'm so super, 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 super proud of you. I can't wait to read, I mean, I can't wait to read the book, and I definitely can't wait for the documentary. Again, congratulations, and I'm so happy for you. Hey, guys, it's Evie Good here. I am life coach. Evie Good, your biggest support, accountability partner, and greatest motivator. Um, I am the host of Shabana's Locally. I am so freaking proud of you. I am so honored to be the host of the show, but I am so motivated to even see how you had the courage to uh, release your trauma to the world. For that, I am forever grateful for you teaching this in this book. I was just doing it, but also for you. I encourage everyone to go out with the book, read it, pack the word along, and take it the word right along. which we know will be phenomenal as your cousin and your auntie. We just want to tell you that we love you and we're so proud of you and congratulations for being such an amazing overcomer. Yes. And we are excited about what's coming next. We love you, girl. Love you. As I said, my name is Elika. I am a certified life coach, but what I did forget to mention is that I specialize in mental health. Um, mental health to me is so important because I remember in school they would always say like a mind is a powerful thing to waste. And we were here the same, but we never truly go into depth of it. If you have such a strong and powerful mental of how you make life choices or how you think, you truly can accomplish or overcome anything. Um, and when I was reading the book, who would have known, I'm like, sheesh. Um, again, I, it was so courageous of you to write the book, but it was also the questions or the thoughts that I had behind um, the traumas and how you overcame them because there are so many people who 
have gone through the same things but never overcame them. Like, you know what I mean? Like, some people don't overcome the traumas and then they turn to codependency as far as drinking or uh, coping mechanisms as drinking or drugs or just rage or anger. Um, so, some of my, we both, myself and Lee Sean and I, have questions, um, I guess, about the book or about yourself. You ready? You want to go? You want to say anything before? I, I, I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> as ready oh, as I'm going to be. So I'm going to ask the first question. Um, where were your initial thoughts and emotions when Spirit told you to write and tell your story? Whew. So um, for many years, I've toyed and joked about, oh, I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to write my story even before I ever decided to put, I won't say pen to paper, but before I decide to type anything in a Word document. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so before I decided to do that, we, that was something that I always like joked about, okay. but never really took, um, took seriously. Okay. I know um, growing up, I'm a church kid, you know, been in church all of my life. So I've always heard, you know, your story is going to bring somebody through your testimony. It's going to, you know, right, right. Be, be the testimony that brings somebody to the other side of this. Okay. So many years that has always played in my head over and over again. So I'm like, all right, I ain't been through all this hell um, to just sit with it. Right. You know, to not. To not give, you know. To not give back or to yeah, not, to to not or give help back. somebody else. Right. Yeah. So that was kind of like the force behind me, um, behind me starting it. But once I actually started, it did come from a place of anger. Okay. So no BS. Yes. <laughs> See, that's what I wanted to get to. I wanted to get to what was the emotion. What yeah. was the thought? Okay. So um, it, it happened, you know, after the birth of my son five years ago. Um, I was told by someone that pretty much I wouldn't, I wouldn't be much of anything. I would just be this, you know, baby mama times two <laughs> and, you know, stuck in my mess. You know okay. what I'm saying? So I was like, you know what? Here's my chance to tell my story. Right, right. My story may be the thing that brings me to that other side. So you're saying I'm not going to be anything, right. but the life that I lived it's, it's proving that I'm going to be more than what you ever thought I could be in right. the first place. Right. So that was that on that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Look. <laughs> Wait. Before I ask my question, can we all just give a round of applause for this beautiful black queen who was courageous enough to share her story with us? Thank you so much. Shaquana came to me um, a year and a half ago. Yeah. About a year and a half ago, I had just started my writing business. It's called Rich Fingers Writing Brand, and I had been posting online. So Shaquana said, bro, I want you to help me to write my story. And I was honored to do it because I've known Shaquana through church and things like that. But to have someone to look at me and look at my business in the beginning and want and trust me enough to actually give me her story that no one else knew and be vulnerable to me I really appreciated that all right um, you can clap it up for that <laughs> so um, Elika talked about Holy Spirit and, and leading you right mm -hmm. so I want to get back into that vein because all I've known, Shaquana is church girl, church girl, church girl, right? So when I'm reading this, I'm editing the book and I'm reading, I'm like, oh, she did some things. Oh, the conversations. <laughs> Don't forget the tea spilling in the conversation. Oh, yes, because we had conversations before stuff I started reading it. Stuff that didn't even get in the book. <laughs> I said, oh, he know more about me than my friends' friends do. <laughs> so my first question is, what role did the church play in you, in your story? Like this, like the sound on this one better. <laughs> um, so for me, um, church, God first has always been like my foundation. Um, I grew up in church, but my for me, my church has been my family. Like that's been my life. When they go to church, I go to church. When they here, I'm there, and that's that. 
own. So that was really like the foundation for me. So when hell came and high water came, it didn't overtake me because I was raised with the prayer life. I was raised to seek scripture for myself. I was raised, you know, to seek God for myself. So that's just one thing, even in all the mess I was in, yes, I still had a conscience. Sometimes I ignored it. Most times I ignored it. But however, I still stood 10 toes down and not ashamed of the mess that I created. You know, I went to my creator to help me fix it. Right. So that's, that's where we, Faith that's where we are. Yeah. Faith, Faith over, over fear. fear. Right. Okay. Next question. You ready? How has the traumas of your childhood affected your date in life, your parenting life, or life in general? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> we get real um, mental health, mental health. So for me, when it comes to um, my parenting, um, I'm very watchful. Um, I don't let a lot of people around my children. Um... And I just, I just make sure that I'm, I'm not so strict on them that they feel like that they, they can't, can't come, come talk to, to me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I want them to be able to say, "Mommy, somebody did this," and and without fear of me reacting right, some right. sort of way. Okay. So that's when it comes to my children and relationships. Lord, we're still working. <laughs> Pray for me. Oh, <laughs> but. It taught me kind of not to take no mess. Okay. Um, don't sit around and wait and wait and wait for somebody to right. change. If the they're not getting on it, mm -hmm. they got to get gone. Um, I found contentment with myself. Okay. Um, so I'm not out here rushing to be in anything, to be with anyone. If it happens, it happens. That's just, you know, I, I'll date here and there. I ain't going to say no to a free meal every now and then. <laughs> it all depends. <laughs> <laughs> you no longer um, I'm just at it. I'm just living life and I'm being watchful. Right. Um I'm like I said I'm not taking no mess things that I've grown up with, you know, traits that I've seen growing up with my dad and things like that those are things that I'm not trying to follow. I learned the what not to do. Um what not to take. Okay. So now in this stage of my life, I'm learning the what to do, the how to be when to be soft okay when i need to be hard okay. you know right. what i'm saying so those are the i'm 30 i'll be 35 yes. in june so don't i got some the, i got some don't time tell people, don't tell the people or don't tell the people <laughs> listen don't i'm aging gracefully i ain't <laughs> never been afraid of age okay so we're we're, we're there but um okay. that's for relationships and life in general, life in general. just not to Life in general, just not to take it so hard. Like, just let, if, it, if it's coming, it's coming. You just be prepared for what's coming. So I feel like the life I lived has prepared me for whatever's coming. I mean, the lessons at this point, the lessons. Yeah. you know. Okay. <laughs> that was good. Let's rotate. So, this question isn't on here. <laughs> but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be hard for you, right? So um when I was writing or editing the book with you, um your dad played a major part in your life and I was I would say that you are a daddy's girl. Explain to me what does it mean to be a daddy's girl and how did that affect your your story? So for <laughs> So for me, um, being a daddy's girl is pretty much daddy's there. When you need him, when you turn around, he going to be there. When you call him, he going to make it happen. And I grew up with that, you know, I grew up around my father. My father wasn't not in the home. I had a two-family um, household for a while, although it may have been a little helter-skelter sometimes. I grew up, you know loved by both of my parents. Both of my parents loved me at the end of every day. So, um, yeah, being a daddy's girl, it's just, I can call on my dad. When my dad come around, it's going to happen. It's, things going to get, things going to get done. But when he not around, that's a whole nother ball game, <laughs> you know? So, 
you know, big spoil your girl, acting out, because dad's not there. Okay. You know, life situations happen, dad had to go. It, it might have been, you know, a light weight lifted off the house because there was a lot going on. Right. But um, if you have read the book, you you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but um, I, I grew up in, you know, kind of like abuse and trauma. You know, um, my dad had issues with um, substance issues and things like that. Thank God he has been delivered um, from that. So, you know, God has been doing his thing. God has been working. God has been rebuilding. Um, so, yeah. And second part of the question. How has that impacted your story? Or you becoming a woman and dealing with these relationships and many things like that? Well, it's been very impactful um, because it's kind of hard knowing who to trust. Um, yeah, it's, it's been very hard. I'm not even going to lie and sit up here like, oh, I got it all together. And, you know, I know how to spot that man when he had, because I've been through a couple of them since then. And it ain't, <laughs> it ain't work out you quite right. Yourself. So, but, um, yeah, this just told me to have patience and be watchful. Okay. So in the book, there are every time I went through the chapters, I'm like, gosh, like I'm taking notes. I'm like highlighting. I'm like, OK, um, again, and I will reflect back to um, the growth, because most of the time mental health looks normal. Like it has become so normal that to someone who has, you know, done the practice, went to school, um, or can identify things, it's like, this is not, you know, it's not normal. Um, but I also know that it's our job and it is imperative to teach and to learn and to find solutions um, to give back and help others, right? So this question is, what advice would you give anyone who has suffered some of the same traumas? Um, seek therapy, seek therapy, seek therapy. Um, for me, although I preach speak therapy, I am not an active participant in therapy. No, no, no. I am not. <laughs> because for me, you've read my story, right? So me dealing with different therapists from uh, the time back when I was kidnapped, my cousin took me to go meet a therapist, and I've seen maybe two or three more after that, and it's always been like... Wow. Like they in shock. They're in shock. Right. And I don't need I don't need the person helping me to be in shock. You understand? Right. So if you're in shock, that means what I got going on is too much for you right now. Right, right. So I go to the only person I know, and that's God. And when I tell you my prayer life, I have not I'll be honest, I have not been in church in a few couple of years. But my relationship with God has strengthened so much more that I don't have the codependency of others around me. This, at this point, this time, I have to go to God for myself. Um, and it only really works out when you put it all out for yourself. So that's been my coping mechanism. And writing, being with my family, like those are the things that get me through, um, that brings me on the other side of my trauma because sitting in it doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't do anything for the people around me to be walking around in depression and sad and mad all the time. When I got two children to raise, I don't want to put what I have going on on them. You know what I'm saying? So I take it what I can take it. I'm going to find a therapist one day. I promise you. I, I promise. You got one for me? What? Send them my way. But okay. yeah, so that's, that's been a... Um, so you would suggest therapy? I would suggest therapy, yes, because you shouldn't have to do it by yourself. A lot right. of people are not built to do it alone. A lot of people didn't, weren't raised with the foundation that I was right. raised with. So although, yeah, I might have been alone, I have several people I can call if I need to. Right. You know what I'm saying? I never, God didn't put me here alone. Right. Although, yeah, I may feel like, oh, nobody's there. Oh, I can't count on nobody for nothing. But in, all, in hindsight, my people are here. You have a good you look, know? as you can see. Right. 
So, um, yeah, stick close to your people. Don't isolate yourself. That's a good one. I just want to say before you ask your question, right, as a certified life coach, um, the difference between a life coach and a therapist is life coach cannot prescribe medication. But I always tell people... um, I don't know what happened. Hello? Oh, looking for a therapist or a life coach, it has to be as comfortable as you speak it to whoever the person or the strongest person in your tribe is. And if it doesn't feel comfortable, that's not the therapist or the life coach for you. But I don't want that to deteriorate you from thinking that um, therapy or life coaching isn't important because it truly, truly is. Like, there's nothing like finding, and uh, I call myself like, I'm your greatest accountability partner. Like there is no right or wrong. It's always just understanding and getting to the solution. But don't just uh, go to therapy and think, or life coach and think you're just going to sit there and they're just going to listen. Because some people are that way. I'm not that way, but I do think that uh, you had therapists who, you know, so that's why I started life coaching. Yeah. And I started life coaching because for me, coming from where we come from and doing the work and doing the help, I feel like it's my job to give back. So people won't be thinking that, you know, therapy or seeking any type of help um, isn't important because most people don't relate to where we come from, if that makes sense. But okay, I'll give it to you. And I thank you, Elika, for creating this space for people to actually be able to be vulnerable because mental health is very important nowadays. And we have to take the stigma off of, you know, we can't get a therapist. And sometimes we have this stigma from being in church because we feel like, you know, we got to take all our problems to God, but we got to take it to somebody else that can actually, you know, take it to somebody that God gave the purpose to help him along the way. Exactly. He gave them wisdom and and the schooling for a purpose. So you mentioned a little bit about you being kidnapped and that was one of my favorite scenes in your book. (laughs) And I'm, I'm, I want to talk about this because when I was reading this, it was very graphic. It, it was very entertaining. And I'm like, wow, this is going to be a movie. Can we all clap it up? Because this is going to be it a documentary. Going to be. I'm speaking Absolutely. to the atmosphere that this book is not just going to be a book, but it's going to be a documentary like we talked about. So what was going through your mind when you were kidnapped? And did you think that you were going to make it out of that situation? Huh. Well, you know, deep breaths. Deep breaths. That day in itself was just an off day. Um, Constantly getting into arguments with my friend at the time. Like we literally about to rock it out in the street and that ain't never happened. So that whole day was kind of off. When it happened, I thought maybe I was just going to get robbed and they were just going to leave me alone and not go on about my business. But no, it didn't end there. Um, And where it happened at, if anybody's familiar um, with South Orange Avenue in North New Jersey, there are usually police officers up and down, up and down South Orange Avenue all day, all night. This particular night, I'm at the bus stop and not a cop in sight, like not a patrol car in sight, like nothing. And there are like two random guys walking past me. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, I'm on the phone with another friend at the time, my best friend at the time. So I'm like, okay, trying to talk to him. And I'm like, you know what? I need to get off the phone so I can, you know, pay attention a little bit. So the guy walked up to me, he's trying to talk to me, and I'm like, no, I'm good, no thank you, and he kept pestering, so for me, my brain said, walk up, which I should have walked down, because it was probably more people, I walked up towards West Orange area, instead of walking down towards the hood, you know what I'm saying, where more eyes would be, I guess, but I wasn't, you know, that hood preview at that time, um, So I was, you know, pretty much snatched off the street from that where nowhere, nobody was around, anything like that. So in that moment, um, only thing I could really think of, because, you know, I wasn't a mom or anything at that time. So 
I'm like, you know, God, if I'm in it, you're going to make a way for me to escape, right? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, all right, it's a plan to escape, you know? And that's all I have kept hearing, you know, escape. I'm, in, I'm locked in a room in some abandoned house at this time. So I'm like, okay, in my head, I'm praying as everything is going on. And then they finished doing what they were doing. They left and they locked me in a room. Before they left, he was saying, you know, don't leave. Stay right here. Um, we got people watching the house. You know, so after a while, I'm like, oh, God, um, I'm going to get out of here. I'm upstairs, locked in this room, nothing but a window. Um, I tried to open the door after a little while, but there was no knob on the inside. So I couldn't get out. The only way of escape was a window. So I'm looking out the window. I'm like, I see two cars. Oh, God, they said somebody was going to be watching the house. So I'm like, do I leave? Do I go? I'm like, you know what? At this point, I'm not going to sit and wait for you to come back and do it again. So if I got to die on these streets, that's just what it is. Okay? So I jumped out of a second floor. Two, was that two stories? I jumped out of a two-story window into some bushes in front of a house. And I ran to the car across the street. And he called my mom and brought me home, and it was just the whole thing. Um, I didn't know for sure if I was going to make it out, but once my feet hit that bush, I was like, all right, I'm out. I didn't break anything, <laughs> thank God. It's like a cat with, you know, the reflexes, bounce right back up. Um, but that whole thing was just like, it was unbelievable to me because nobody – ever so much really no man has really dis even disrespected me nobody has ever even called me out my name at this point you know so it's kind of like where did this even come from you know I didn't do anything I just said no thank you I don't want to talk and you could have just went on about your business but instead you decided to take something that didn't belong to you so I'm like okay God is this what I got to do? Is this the stigma that I have to have on my life now? Now I have to be like embarrassed because now everybody knows what happened to Kwana. Right, you know, right. my family, I'm like, oh God, <laughs> they don't even know that I'm actually having sex. But now they, they see somebody that violated me. Like, what is this? Right. Like, what's going on? I'm supposed to be this this, innocent. this church girl, this innocent baby that's loving on everybody and, you know, doing what, you know, the Bible's supposed to, be, you know, be telling me to do, but I'm doing the complete opposite. So now it's because I'm doing the complete opposite that this happened to me. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I, I dealt with them things like, God, I was really trying to do the right thing that night. I didn't want to smoke weed that night. Oh, wow. okay. My friend... We, we made a deal. We weren't going to smoke weed. We were trying to get jobs. Oh, and look. I get back to the house, and she's looking for the weed, man. And I'm like, girl, I didn't we just say we wasn't going to be smoking? <laughs> and we got into an argument about that. That's what made me get up and go home go and go home. to the bus stop. So I'm like, okay, God, I'm trying to do what's right. And I walked into this. Yes, right. You know what I'm saying? So that was a big battle with, you know, do I even want to be bothered with God at this point? You're about to answer my next question. Don't you do it. So be, before you go. But. Go. <laughs> but. Okay. That change that following Sunday, it happened on the weekend that following Sunday, my cousin, Pastor Gia. Hey, cousin. <laughs> she preached. Um, her title was, My Condition Is Not My Conclusion. I do not remember the scripture. I don't. But the title has always stuck with me. What I'm going through right now, it does not determine what I'll be. Right. So that stuck with me the entire time. Yeah, that happened to me, but that's not my life. That's right. not my story. Somebody else has gone through it and took their own life. Right. Somebody else has gone through it and are straight promiscuous out here. Somebody else has gone through it and they walked away with diseases that they can't get rid of. Right. But God kept me. Right. He kept me covered. No pregnancies, no diseases I couldn't get rid of. Like, right. you know, he kept me. So, yes, I went through the thing, but and I got on the other side. You're not what you went through. Right. It's me? Oh, it was me. Yep. Yeah. See, you was about to answer my question. Okay. So, with that, because I see how you reflect back to God, my next question was, um, do you have any regrets 
in reference to, like you said, making decisions, but also at what point or what what was the time that you were angry at God? And I say that because most times we go through things and before we grow through them, certain things really do make you question God or make you be angry because you're like, why me? Or why has this happened to me? Or why are all these things? And it takes a such faith, like I always tell people faith over faith, like I literally repeat that to myself all the time, um, to to not be angry at God and keep walking in faith to know. So at what point or what situation where you were that angry to uh, question God or be angry at God and then do you have any regrets? Um, I'll say the um, the questioning God has not stopped. I'm always I always got questions for God. Like what what's up? <laughs> you know, it's it's always and we here. So I right. get to I get to talk to him. I get to ask him questions. Um we grew up with people saying, Don't question God, don't question right. God. No, have a conversation with your Absolutely. father. Talk to him, question him. He'll answer you, sit down and listen. If you sit and listen right. long enough, you're gonna get your answer. Right. You're gonna find out exactly why you which why you went through what you went through. Right. So for me, yeah, um, I constantly question, am I angry with him? No. Um, I don't think, I don't think I was angry to the point where I was like, I don't want nothing to do with him. I've never gotten to that point. Thank God. I've never gotten to that point. I don't ever want to get to the point where I say, you know, a reprobate mind. I don't want that. Right. I always want to be conscious of what God wants for my life. Um, and I'm always trying to be, trying to submit myself, you know, to his purpose. Um, I may not know the entire purpose yet, but as I come along, as I grow, I see, yes, I'm here for this purpose. I'm here for her. I'm here for him. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my clients, that's, those are like your people. Like, you know, they're, they're with me every week, every month. Right. So they feel when I'm off. I feel when they off. <laughs> so right. we 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 pray for each other. We talk to each other. We may talk through things. So I'm connected to different people in many different ways. Um, especially women. Lord knows we <laughs> look since fifth grade, and we deal with them on a regular. <laughs> But we, we weren't like that back in the day. We locked with each other and everybody else was an outsider. No, you know what I'm saying? It really was that way. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when, it, when it comes to my adulthood now, I'm welcoming of the women. I'm supporting of my sisters because that's what I feel like I didn't have. So I always wanted to be to others what I wanted. So that's why I'm here. I'm opening up, creating avenues to get my sisters, my brothers on to, you know, showcase their talents to, you know, pretty much be a backbone for each other because oftentimes we don't have that. We sit with ourselves. We sit with our thoughts. I'm a person that's constantly in my head all the time. So I'm trying to teach myself how to speak up when I need to speak up. Because if you let it keep festering and festering and you're thinking about it, when it does come up, it makes it seem like you're doing too much. But you've been sitting with these things. I call it a a soda bottle. Like, you you shake up a soda bottle and then it explodes because you never let it out yet. Exactly. So that's one thing. That's probably what I need therapy for. Because I, (laughs) I stay in my head a lot. But I feel like it's a good thing that I'm in my head a lot because it, it also helps me think things through before I react, before I say something, before I tell you how I really feel. Let me sit and think with this. Do you really deserve what I want, what I want to say right now? Because my words can be a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You actually touched on my next question. So there's a popular song out. I'm going to edit it. These blank ain't loyal, right? So I'm gonna say these friends ain't loyal. Foes ain't loyal. <laughs> what say what? These foes ain't loyal. <laughs> <laughs> so in your book, um, you went through your trauma with a lot of your friends, or at the time you thought they were your friends. They may have been your friends and then changed, switched up on you. Um, there was one particular person. Her name is Trinity. Um, how did Trinity betray you in this in the book, and how did that impact your relationship with females? going forward. Lord. Trinity, mm-hmm. she betrayed me on many different levels. 
um, she was pretty much untrustworthy. Um, the major thing was, well, the first major thing was she slept with a boyfriend of mine. Um, even after that, because bros before hoes, right? So even after that, I um, tried to rekindle a friendship with her, tried to keep that same, you know, sisterhood. But the night that happened to me, um, I was leaving her house. Um, I actually asked her sister, could she take me home? My mom would give her gas money. And it was no, so but stop, I go. Um, after that, she, her family found out, I believe, that one of the guys went to school bragging about it. Her, her family is in, like, you know, the police department, school system, stuff like that. So they heard what was going on. So this is how they got caught because the boy went to school bragging about it. But um, Trinity never came to see me. She never called to see how I was. Um, and then she went talking about it. So I ran into a guy that I used to talk to and he's like, oh yeah, I heard about what happened to you. And I'm like, what do you mean? What happened to me? You know, he's like, yeah, your friend told me, no, well, I call her my sister at that time. You know, I don't normally use the friend word. If, if we're in, you're my sis, that's it. And friend, whatever, you're my sister. Um, so Instead of her coming to see about me, how I've done many times, you know, from the moment I met her, her mom would be putting her out the house and she would be coming to live with us. Eighth grade. Who's getting what child is getting put out the house in eighth grade? But um, she spent a lot of her time with me. But in hindsight, everybody around me is like, uh, they didn't really like Trinity. You know, nobody really liked her. My family, my other friends. So the moment there was an issue with us, everybody was ready to go because nobody really liked her. People couldn't understand why I wouldn't leave this girl alone. But I'm like, I wanted sisters. I have brothers. I don't have any sister friends, you know. My cousins got sisters. They, that's they sisters, you know. <laughs> but I want my own sister. So I was trying to, you know, create that um, for myself. But that part was a fail. But, um... It caused me to look at a lot of people differently. Every sis is not. Everybody's it's, it's like not. Sis. It's yeah. not for everybody. You know what I'm saying? So you, I have to take a lot of those things with a grain of salt nowadays. I have to allow people to prove themselves. Um, because for me, when I'm in, I'm in. So <laughs> we rolling, <laughs> you rocking, I'm rolling, and that's just how it's going to go. Um, that's how I was raised. That's how I was brought up. Um, we're not going to let anybody else fall to the side. If we rocking together, we're going to stay together. And once right. you show me that you're not rocking, you got to go. So, yeah, that, that's, that's what helped me in my friendship area these days. Um, tread lightly again. Even with my regular relationships, I feel like it all... It all plays the kind of same play, same playing ground. You really have to be watchful of the people that you bring around you, you bring into your circle. Um, and, and make sure that they're on the same wavelength. Like, right. if I can't get myself through in prayer today, who can I call? Right. Like, we don't got to be on the phone long. Just pray for me. All right, bye. And, and I know you're going to go to God on, on my behalf. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking for these days in, inside of a friendship because, yeah, some, some days I'm, I'd be too tired to pray. But I text my cousin, hey, Jira, <laughs> pray. All right. right. I like that. Okay, so you kind of went into the next question because this is kind of for the both of y'all. Um, I know you said you just started out with starting your business and this is your first book. I'm sure, well, actually it's your second, isn't it? Second, second book. Um, but this one was different because even, like I said, reading it each chapter, I'm like, you know what? <laughs> what is she trying to do to me? I'm writing notes like I'm about to be a therapist. You hear me? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> um, but... Um, like I said, it got so deep and for you to reach out and it wasn't like you, you did it on your own because somebody with such uh, traumas or things they've gone through, a past trauma, shall I say, um, that's kind of vulnerable, like you said, to have somebody else help you co-write, edit it. Um, how was it trusting 
him and how was it for you to not, you know, sometimes you tell people your deepest secrets and they view you so differently. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and you think you trust them and you think that everything's the same, but then it's, it becomes judgy. Even in the church, it's sad to say we're not supposed to, but it we do. Um, so how was it even with you seeing the stories and hearing things like, was there ever a time that, I don't want to say afraid, but it was like, well, maybe we should put this or let's put this or like, how was it for both of y'all? So for me, um, I started this project, like I said, just talking about, oh, I'm going to write a book about my life one day, you know, and um, I eventually was like, okay, let's start. So I reached out to Gia and Jira. We, you know, I started writing some things. I submitted some things uh, to be edited and looked over um, and I had to finish up. I had, I, I went to work, not working. I did like 25 pages <laughs> and clocked out. By the time I got home to complete the project, all 25 of those pages did not auto save. So I was stuck with 25 pages missing. That took me completely out. I, I didn't have the... I didn't have any more juice in me to continue to try to do it again. So I sat on it for a while and I wrote another book, <laughs> a book that ain't have nothing to do with this, but um, I needed to do something because I'm like, all right, I got everybody amped on social media. I, been, I was in releasing excerpts and everybody's waiting for the story and Be Your Own Boss came out there like, is this the book? I'm like, no, that's not the book. <laughs> But it's coming. Um, at that point, I was like, I'm very straight to the point. I don't do a lot of talking. This is a lot for me right now. Um, real quick, I'm telling you where to go and how to get there, and that's that. Um, and that's all I had for this. So I'm like, I need somebody that's very creative with their words. I need somebody that's pretty much a wordsmith know what they talking about, know how to take my story and stretch it. Um, Cause that's something I don't know how to do. Um, so I reached out to Lee Sean. I'm like, okay, yes, I've, I've been under his spoken word, poetry for many years coming up as kids and things like that. So I know where he's at with his words. I reached out to him and I'm like, bro, I got a project for you. Let's get this money. <laughs> And let's work together. And from day one, it's just been like it was. It wasn't. It wasn't any any walls to break down. It just it just flowed. And that should, I was actually freely talking to this guy, telling him all of my tea, like really. So it was just a smooth thing. And I feel like um, what you're reading is a great combination of us both. Um, it's showcasing both of us pretty well. Um, I've a lot of things you're saying. People, once they start reading and they can't put it down, right. it's like, oh my God, this is like a movie. Oh my God, what are you doing next with this? So, yeah, so I appreciate you. Um, I'm grateful for you. And I look forward to working with you <laughs> in the future. Part two. Part two I, and three and four. I still got four. a lot more life right. to live. <laughs> I would say um, when you came to me, I was excited. Um, number one, like I said before, for someone to trust me, and I had just started my writing business, you came to me, you said, I want to write my story. So of course you knew me from spoken word and things like that, but you trusted me in, as far as being a writer of your book. And as far as being judgy, I feel that as people, we do too much of that. We don't give people the grace that we want. And each and every day we, we sin, we fall. We're not perfect, but we want that grace from God every single day. But we don't give people the grace that we want. So when she came to me with a story, I wasn't judgy at all. I was a little bit shocked, <laughs> but I wasn't judgy. And I, want, I encouraged her because at one point Shaquana said, bro, I don't know if I could do this. I, I, I want to stop. And I'm like, nah, we started and we're going to finish. So... I was glad that she was very coachable. Um, she was actually one of my, my favorite clients to work with. Um, there were some times where our schedules kind of got a little 
hectic, but what I liked about her and myself was that we, we communicated very well with one another about our schedules and things like that. And like I said, she was coachable. If I said, yo, I, can we add a poem here? And she was like, sure. So Add two more. <laughs> So it was a, a great experience, and like I said, reading your story, I was, I was actually watching a movie while I was writing and editing, and the fact that you allowed me to add my creativity in it and be your co-writer, and you weren't, you weren't just like, this is my story, and you know, I'm just going to put you as, you know, the editor. No, on the book cover, which what do you guys see? What's on the book cover? All right, so clap it up for the collaboration that God allowed to happen because I would say that it was God ordained, and like you said, many, many, many more. Do you have any more questions? Sure, I got more questions. You want to ask? Let them ask questions. Anyone out here have any questions? I like an interactive audience. I got a question back there. Lord, where's the back of the book? <laughs> I'll just say a brief synopsis of the book. It's just taking place of my life from childhood to adulthood. Um, most of the end of the adulthood, it goes through pretty quick because we kind of see where I am now. So I didn't feel the need to dive into my current years. Um, it's pretty much... You know, growing up in a house, you know, having <clears throat> having watched, you know, my mom being abused and then having to be in a single parent household um, while mom has to work and me and my brothers are home alone and or, you know, at one time, both of my brothers were in and out of the youth house. So it leaves me, you know to figure things out while mom's at work or they have my mom and my grandmother's in one courtroom and then the other one's in this courtroom. So um, it goes pretty much, you know, my life. Um, I, it's kind of hard for me to give a synopsis. Um, yeah, it's literally just my life, my trauma on, on display and overcoming them. So, yeah. Um, I feel like a weight has been lifted. Um, I'm no longer carrying these secrets around. Um, yeah, that's just, it's the freedom of it all. Um, so free indeed. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions, comments, questions for any of us? I do have books here for sale. Okay, I got you. You want paperback or hardcover? I got you. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> UG? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my biggest inspiration. <laughs> My biggest inspiration for this book um, will probably be like my children. Um, they get to see that their mom is no joke. Their mom has been through a lot of things, but their mom is making it happen. Yes. Their mom is not begging, borrowing, or stealing to provide for them. You know what I'm saying? So mommy's making it happen. <laughs> So they have been like my biggest inspiration and also just, you know, having the push of my parents. Um, yes, I get on their nerves. They get on mine. But they always going to push me to do my best. So, yeah. Any other Anybody comments? else? Anybody else have questions? Um... Some things um, when it comes to like, you know, relationships with family and things like that, um, because I spent so much of that time trying to 
push myself back away from things. I feel like I didn't build as strong bonds as I should have. Or when I look at my other family members and I see how close they are with each other and it kind of makes you feel like you're the eyeball out sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I, those are things like um, I'm, I'm still working on because I don't want to be that. Like I love family. Um, I would say if my family not here, I love you. <laughs> That's what I said with my family. I love y'all too. Oh, I love with my family, I'm like no outsider should be able to get a ticket because you know they should they should just sell it out because it's just them. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just happy to see my core people here, the ones that have never left my side, the ones that have been there through every court date. Because yeah, I had I've been there too. We wrote about that, right? Yeah, we wrote about that, right? Yeah, I've, I've been there, too. You know what I'm saying? So, and, you know, every step of the way, my family has been there with my mom to help her with her children and all the things like that. So, yeah, it's just the family thing for me. That's one thing that I just want to keep working on and continuing to build. And I do believe we have been doing a very good job at that lately. So clap it up for my family. Right. <laughs> um, as far as like anything else, um, any other traumas, I feel like, you know, I'm done. When it comes to relationships, I don't take what the previous person did to me and bring it into the next I give everybody a clean slate you know what that person did ain't got nothing to do with you however what that person did it it, it gives you that flag it, it lets you know it makes you aware when things are okay yeah that happened before that we're not gonna do that again not for the circus you have to pay attention <laughs> when the, whatever color the flag is it ain't for when the it pop circus. up you pay attention <laughs> okay <laughs> and I, I feel like i live my life in a constant fight or flight type of situation so in my head i'm like is this person right i'm right well it ain't going right. Well, we about to block you. Flight. It's time to go. You know what I'm saying? So I do appreciate that. Um, I call it the gift of goodbye. I've never had a long goodbye, and I don't need a long goodbye. So sometimes some of us need to recognize that we don't need long goodbyes. We don't need to go back and get closure. It closed when you walked away. Okay? So, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Any, anybody else? Any other questions? No? That's it? Is that all the questions? Oh, go ahead. I do believe I do believe my own trauma has fueled my personality. Um, it made me deaf. I've always been a little feisty, but <laughs> always been a little feisty. But um, now I'm feisty for the right reasons. I'm not just out here popping off because somebody looked at me or said something. You know, I'm actually popping off for right reasons these times. You know, I'm popping off, you know, to help people start businesses. I'm popping off to send people to the to the life coaches and the therapists. You know, that's what I'm doing. I'm 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 arriving. The arrived me. Did y'all read that? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The soda bottle. Well, yes, we discussed. We discussed the soda soda bottle effect. We discussed how I'm constantly in my head about things. Um, a lot of times I'm in my head because I don't want to hurt feelings when I do say something. You know. <laughs> But sometimes you need to sit and think about the things that you're going to say because when you say things, you can't take it back. Well, I call it, you know what it is? Sometimes people, you know, like if there's a disagreement, right? If we have a disagreement, um, some people like to just sit and instantly talk about it, like instant gratification, instant whatever it is. And some people need that space to truly 
calm down and think, right? But I call it, that's why I say an understanding, because mm -hmm. if I if I love you, or I understand you, therefore I love you in your love language. So if you're the person who likes to the instant gratification, then yeah, I'll give it to you. And if you're the person who you need that space, I'm gonna give you that space. But at some point, we have to come to that understanding, right? But it can't be a force because then that soda bottle, because now you, you know, it's like when you say you, you, you're poking at the beer. It's like sometimes you gotta give it that, that space and then let the natural flow come to where the answer is or whatever it is. That's just mm -hmm. I get a you. perspective of things. <laughs> Anybody else have any um, questions? Yes. Yes. That's a good um, question. Well, <laughs> there'll definitely be a part two coming at some point. I don't have a date set for that, but the next phase we'll be working on the documentary of Who Woulda Known. So it kind of gives you some visuals. Um, I know while y'all reading it, y'all are you have no choice but to create the visuals yourself, right? Um, and that's how we wanted it to flow. Like we needed it to your mind to create the visuals of what's going on. So um, we're actually creating the visuals. That's what I wanted to do initially because like I took a break and I said, I'm not writing this no more. Let's do a documentary. So I reached out to my godmother like, hey, Deborah, how you doing? <laughs> I'm going to need, you know, the production company, you know. And so we started working on things. She actually reached out to me um, not too long ago and said, you know, she ran into just talking, you know, her husband just talking like he talks all the time. And, <laughs> and he ran into some guys that documentaries are all that they do. Um, so now we're working on, you know, getting everything together to start this project. So... I love that. The documentary is coming. Yes, I love that. <laughs> well, to anyone who is trying to, free, like, if you did not read the book, please get the book to read it. It is really a great book. And I say that not just to, number one, support Shaquana, but also because there are things in a book that we too may have gone through. Um, and it takes courage to um, even publicly publish the book, but I encourage it for if you are reading it, it may trigger you, right? And that's a good thing because if it does, then that means that that is something that you probably have, I call it pushed to the wayside because that's most of the time how people just go through things. So that's technically how we were taught in our culture. You know, just be quiet, push it to the back, don't say nothing. But I'm encouraging everyone here to read it because we may have gone through it or we are friends or family with people who have gone through that and it's not even comfortable to open up and speak about it. Um, so yes, please get the book. Please support. Um, I'm sure we're about to do the book signing now. So yes, y'all are more than welcome to go over and ask questions and get a copy of the book. Yes. Thank you, everyone. So the winning number is six eight five five eight nine. We got a winner. Congratulations to the winner, getting an iPad Pro and an Apple Pencil. It's an extra special day. Um, I lost my brother back in 2006 to a car accident. And March 4th is his birthday. 
So it's, you know, honoring him because I know, first of all, if he would tell you, I probably would have never went through half of the things that's in this book in the first place. <laughs> that's a fact. But, um, yeah, I just, every day, I just miss my brother. Um, it's been a while since 06, and it, it doesn't get um, easier. You just learn how to, you know, live life. Um, <laughs> happy birthday, Scooter! <laughs> And, um, you know, I dedicated my book to my brother. And um, this year I also lost my aunt. And I, I put her in, you know, my acknowledgments. I'm like, my auntie's going to love this. She didn't get a chance to read the book yet. Um, but I know she's proud of me. She always was, you know, Kwani, you can do it. Kwani, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, so I just know she's looking down with all her love and support. Um, yeah, so big ups to my auntie Jean and big ups to Scooter. Rest in eternal peace. Um, <laughs> first, I just want to thank everybody for coming out and, um, Thinking it not robbery to show your love to me tonight. Um, I feel very, very, very happy. Um, I was thinking like, oh, it's just going to be like five of us in here, y'all. But you know we're going to make it do what it do anyway. But I'm so excited to see the outcome that I have. Um, I also would like to touch on... Um, I don't know if you noticed, there's like a cash app um, scan card and it says mask off. Um, my life has taught me that um, my life is not my own. To God, I belong, right? And everything that I went through is, is a building block to help pull somebody else on the other side of whatever they're going through. Um, so with that, I, um, I prayed about it, talked to God about it, talked to my cousin about it, and um, confirmation more so that the nonprofit is um, where my heart is, um, and the name of that nonprofit is Mask Off. You may notice you see the mask up here. Um, the mask is on my book cover and things like that, and um, I feel like for a lot of my life, I lived behind this mask. Um, and so many of us live behind a mask. Um, we don't present our true selves to, you know, the people that we meet. And when we're not doing that, we're stunting our own growth and we're stunting the possible growth of someone else. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about um, mask off. Um, the acronym for MASK is Mindset, Ability, Skills, and Knowledge. A mask off is not about you telling the world your truth, but to learn how to stand in your truth and actually be present in your trauma. Oftentimes, we learn to disassociate ourselves from things that we have experienced, which in turn prevents us from true healing. When we disassociate from our problems, the most minute things can trigger us or we tend to repeat the same cycles. I know this to be true because I have experienced it and have heard countless similar stories. Mask Off Foundation will be the bridge to get you on the other side of your hardships. Whether it's mental health referrals, because I ain't nobody's counselor, um, business mentoring, or simply having an outlet to release what has us bound. Although this foundation is geared towards young women and adult women, we are also here for our brothers, for our men, to get them the help that's due to them as well, because oftentimes they are also overlooked because they're the men and they're supposed to have it together. They can't fall, you know, under pressure. So they need the outlet as well. Um, your trauma may not look like mine. I happen to be one of the ones that's been chosen to recover out loud. I am absolutely okay with giving a voice to my brothers and sisters who still suffer in silence. I stand here as a testament to Revelations 12 and 11. I am a conqueror and have overcome by the blood of Christ and the power of my testimony. 
I want you all to know that whatever has a grip on your voice has to bow down to the oil that is on your life. We need to be so connected to our growth that we won't allow who we were to stand in the way of who we are becoming. And if I can say any final words, it would be when they can't touch what you have become, they'll dig up who you used to be. Don't let that stop you from moving forward. Don't let them, I mean, let them carry around the baggage from your past because you put that shit down a long time ago. Again, thank you all for coming. I love you.